All right, let's, let, enough bad news. How about some good news? Gallup's Economic Confidence Index, Ben, went positive in April for the first time since March. Negative 33 was the low. Still got some room to run here, it looks like, though. Blue skies, my friend. Okay. All right. Um, back to the negative stuff. <laughs> and then we're going to get to the positive, I think. Listen, you're, you're wearing a pink shirt. There's no room for negativity here. Your shirt screams sunshine and, and optimism. You love commenting on my clothing. Only when it's pink. I never I'm, talk I'm about consistent. I never mention <laughs> your, uh, your printed T-shirts, your logo T-shirts that you wear. Um, it's a great day. All right. That's fine. Uh, no, I'll take it. That's fine. I, I mean... <laughs> All right. This is like some congressional research report. They look at the U.S. income distribution trends. Uh, we've talked about this one before, but this is just showing the percentage of children with income greater than their parents at age 30. They showed children's born in 1940, 1950, all the way through 1984. Bottom? I think in 1940, 92% had greater incomes than their children at age 30. 1950 was 79. By 1970, it was 61. By 1980, 1984. So that's basically you and me. Right. 50, 50 it's 50-50. Now, I think there's a good explanation for this. Go ahead. So, death? Death? Longevity? Yeah, that's part of it. Someone born in 1940, their parents lived through World War I, <laughs> the Great Depression, and then right when they were born, World War II. I mean, it kind of makes sense that in, that in those instances in 1940s, 50s, and 60s, a 30-year-old was making more than their parents, who were probably one of them was off to war. Yeah, Ben, and, if you're – yeah, if okay, so again – 92% of people born in 1940 made more than their parents. Think about somebody born in 1940. It's possible that their parents lived through the Panic of 1907, World War One, Spanish flu. <laughs> Spanish flu, yeah. Uh, Great the Depression. Depression. And World War II. Yes. So take that with a grain of salt. But now this is from the FT, and they wrote a piece that was all about basically millennials are not happy and they're all insecure. And they show this chart that we talked about before about boomers have so much more. It's like in nineteen nine, in the nineteen nineties, boomers were in their thirties. They had twenty one percent of household wealth. Millennials are three percent. Oh, this chart again? Yeah, it's it's similar. Now boomers have fifty seven. Uh, millennials not much higher. Um, and they go through all these examples of people um, say that they're like paddling hard just to stand still, and it's exhausting being a millennial. And they everything is so much more expensive. And to millennials' credit. Like everything for our generation has been expensive. We had higher priced college, right? We came out and then it was harder to find a job for many people because of the Great Recession. Can't buy stocks on the cheap anymore. Stocks Thanks. are expensive. Housing Thanks, is Jerome. expensive. So I think yeah. that, that's the whole point of this. Um, and so this person in it, they, they interviewed people from all around the world. And this person from the UK said, I have in what other generations would be considered a well paying job, but I can barely afford a two bedroom flat within commuting distance to raise a family. So I, I certainly feel for millennials here, like, in some ways, we've gotten a bad, bad rap. But here's the other side of this. Here's like potentially, I think, a good potential sign. So Kevin Roos at the New York Times wrote a piece called Welcome to the YOLO Economy. And he's talking about how now a lot of young people are like completely burnt out because of the pandemic and their jobs. And now they finally have some savings. They've gotten some money or they haven't been doing stuff. And people are like abandoning their jobs and abandoning cities and moving elsewhere and trying to follow their dreams a little bit. And maybe that is starting a business. Maybe that is moving somewhere else where it's not so expensive. Um, I think this is, and, and a lot of the people said the same things about um, how like the pandemic has completely changed their viewpoint on life. And I think this is potentially a net positive where people use the pandemic as a springboard for something, whether it's looking for a new, even if it's a new remote job or starting a new business. I think this is, this could be looked back at as, as a turning point for the millennial generation. What are your thoughts? I agree. Like, ha have you heard friends or, or pe family members or people just say like, hey, I never would have done this before, but because of the pandemic, this we're, I'm going to give this a try. I've got a very small circle of friends, Okay, if you even want to call them that. <laughs> okay, but I'm trying to look at this and, and say, I, I think this, this could be a positive where people say, you know what? Whatever I was doing, I, I wasn't happy doing it anyway. I might as well try to do something I'm happy with and maybe that leads to better outcomes. I'm looking for the positive spin here for, for millennials because obviously it sounds like a lot of millennials are, are unhappy. But I, I just think in general, if you grew up on the internet, you're probably going to be unhappy. Most people who have spent their entire lives on the internet are probably unhappier than the alternative. That's a big brush. I, I just think it's easier to be subjected to negativity when you're on the internet at all times. That's true. That is definitely, definitely true. That's what, So I think that 
younger generations and people who grew up with the internet now are going to be more cynical in their disposition because of that. Scott Galloway did this thing uh, last week, and he's gotten dunked on for his comments about sex and, and young men not having sex. But I, I do think there's something here. So 28% of men between 18 and 30 reported no sex in the past year. This is by far, by far the highest that it's been going back to 1989. And here's what he says about it. This isn't about sex, but a wider range of attachments. As a species, we need physical and social contact, and we crave deep, meaningful bonds. Men who fail to attach to partners, careers, or communities grow bitter and seek volatility and unrest. They are more susceptible to fringe theories and over-index on, on online forums filled with misogynist content and misinformation. Economic inequality and elasticity are correlated with violence and instability, and studies of gun violence in the U.S. find the strong association with decreased social mobility." Marriage, on the other hand, correlates with reductions in crime and may even have a, ca a causal effect on reducing it. So this is where it gets really uh, dark and dangerous. And the number of mass shootings that we're seeing on a daily basis is absolutely alarming. Yeah, I, I think that's that's what I'm. It, it's easier for people to find that stuff if they're if they're inclined that way. Anyway, they're pushed even further. Right. Anyway, but by the way, not to like this is a hard turn, but. Uh, when I first saw that, so it said young men having sex over, what is it, 28% now, and in, in 2008, it was like under 10%. So it's got a huge, it skyrocketed. My, Sky right. my yeah. first thought was um, men were better at lying about having sex before <laughs> than they are now, as far as surveys go. Anyway, that's probably, I'm just kidding. Um, that's, okay. Uh, <laughs> it's not a terrible <laughs> take, but all right. I'm, this is me being an anti-survey person and looking, yeah. trying to punch holes in this. All right, so we have- But on, like the, a, on the other hand, well, say what you were going to say. No, I'll keep going because I'm I'm pivoting here. On the other hand, a house in the Hamptons just went through for two million dollars. Okay, that's fair. Maybe that's why people are negative because they uh they 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 see that. All right, so we've got this weird bifurcation going, where inflation is affecting different areas of the income spectrum and the economy. Uh, so again, uh, a house just rented for two million dollars in the Hamptons for the summer. Again, a rental, a rental, unbelievable. Uh. Derek Thompson tweeted that Manhattan rents have fallen to their lowest levels since 2010. Brooklyn is at their lowest level since 2011. So you've got ridiculous, ridiculous unaffordability at the ultra high end. Or maybe I guess you can afford it. If you've got $100 million in Ethereum, what's a $2 million rental? You've got unaffordability at the mid to high end, right? Like the the... $1.3 million small homes in Seattle that people are emailing us about. And then on the low end or for renters, you got some nice affordability. Yeah. So it's the lowest, cheapest Manhattan uh, rental rate since 2010. Can you imagine a period where you can do this for everything that's having a pandemic, but imagine going back 18 months ago and saying, Hey, by the way, the housing market is going to take off like a rocket ship and real estate in Manhattan and rents and real estate in Manhattan are going to drop like a rock. Right. What situation would make sense for that to happen? Um, so yeah, I so again, for young I, I people, this is a good thing. I fell for it. I fell for a chart crime. Okay. For the first, this is from Bloomberg. For the first time in more than fifteen years, it's cheaper to buy a new house than a previously owned dwelling. And I saw that Ben, and without doing any critical thinking, I ran with it. I feel like you've sent like three tweets on this one. Just one. One. Okay. All right. Um, so, so how? Why is it a chart crime? So here it is. So the median sales price of a previously owned single family home rose to three hundred thirty-four thousand dollars. New properties sold for a median of $330,000. So here's why it's a chart crime. Do you know what the hottest housing market... Uh, I haven't had a chance to read this article. It just came out. I just saw a tweet. The house, hottest housing market in America is Lakeside, Idaho. And I'm just going to guess that these are new houses. I, okay. I, I, I'm just going to guess. I, so I, when I was in Fort Lauderdale, I was on Zillow. Isn't house searching on Zillow like the most fun thing? Yeah. I think Zillow as a brand has cemented itself as like the real estate brand, right? They, they had the SNL skit a few weeks ago. Zillow. 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 This is where you say disclosure long. <laughs> yes. Dis disclosure, I'm long like 12 shares or something. And, and not to brag, but let me, I also have a position. <laughs> position. I own, ooh, I own 10.4 shares of Zillow. This is, we're us putting our money where, their mouth is, where our mouth is for the real estate stuff. There we coming. go. Yeah, we're, we're eating our own, we're eating our own cooking. But anyway. I think as far as, is that, like, Zillow could own the real estate industry if they wanted, I think, because they have that brand cachet. So I've been getting alerts on my phone for sales, for home sales in Fort Lauderdale, 
homes that are hitting the market and it's 3 million, it's 4 million. These are all existing homes. Houses that are being built in Phoenix are they're not building nine million dollar homes, right? So it's the average is, is skewed. So this is a location story more than anything else. And here's here's the joke that I tweeted yesterday: used cars are now more expensive than new cars, but the used car is a '69 Corvette and the new car is a Kia Sorento or whatever. That's like that's basically what's going on here. Here's here's something I don't get, and we're gonna get this to an email from a listener for this. When you hear about these, people keep saying like, oh, all cash offer. Someone took me from, who the hell has enough cash to make an all cash offer? Yeah, I don't. Where's yeah. this cash coming from? Yeah, that's a, uh, the sidelines. Does someone, but does someone save up for a house or are these just like. No, here's, here, it has to be the sale of a business or, or parents. But here's the out. thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm guessing that's part of it is parents giving a loan or just giving money. But well, like, how about this? When I sold my apartment in Brooklyn, it was an all cash offer. It was a young person whose parents bought her the apartment. Right. But the thing is like. I shouldn't be, people in our age group should not be competing with all cash offers. That's correct. I, that, um, that's, it's not, that's, that, that's not, for, so here's someone sent us this. Um, I've now heard from three different couples here in Austin. By the way, we get a ton of real estate stuff from Austin. It sounds like it's just going nuts there. Who use a service like this. It's called Homeward, buy with cash, to make all cash offers and win. I know you've talked about companies helping people put down 20 payments for the upside and the sell, but this sounded new and maybe looking into. So this is a company where you put down like a good faith deposit they buy all cash for you. And then after it goes through, then you set up a mortgage with them, which seems like oh, a really convoluted way of doing okay. this. Okay. By the way, those services didn't really pick up that much. I know it's, it's a, who did we, I'm drawing a blank. Who did with we have? Unison. Unison. Right. I haven't seen much from them or competitors. I'm guessing part of it is the fact, it, it is a really cool idea. Part of it is because it helps you come up with a, you give up some of your equity and they help you with the down payment. I think part of it is the fact that you have to wait so long to potentially get a payout on that. But in this market, maybe you shouldn't have to wait so long because things are selling and people are selling way quicker. I don't know. But again, the all cash offers, who are these people? Yeah. Where? <laughs> I don't, okay, here's one. All right. Uh, so we've been talking about this listener in Seattle who is having a, hard time buying a house. And I said, well, why don't you move? That's the alternative. It's not the easy move. So here's an email. I feel for the listener who's struggling in Seattle to buy a house. My wife and I were chasing the exploding Seattle area housing market from 2014 to 2019. While the family slowly but surely outgrew our little rental. We watched prices in our neighborhood roughly double in those five years and eventually admitted we couldn't compete. We moved 250 miles inland to a small town where we could afford whatever house we wanted. Now I finally own my own house with room for everyone and plenty of cash left over. Success, right? Not entirely. Job opportunities in our new town are very limited. The schools aren't as good. There's a lot less to do. And we left a lot of relatives and good friends behind. We made a big trade-off between home ownership and other aspects of life and still wonder if we did the right thing. Rough. That's, That's tough. Rough. Be yeah. Because... You 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 always second guess yourself with these things. You just don't know when you make this type of decision. Am I? What am I doing here? I'm, I'm uprooting, and is it worth it if I'm paying fifty percent of my gross income for housing or whatever? And we don't have as much money to save, or private schools potentially if we wanted, or whatever it is that you think you want to do. If housing is eating up that much of your budget, yeah, I this this is the, This is a tough one. And and to plug us our podcast from last week with uh, Fundrise and Ben Miller, he said he thinks the answer is to to rent and invest in real estate. A lot of people wrote in and said, I don't know how re realistic that is, depending, because in some places, it's very hard to find rentals. Like rent, renting a house, for instance, is a lot harder than renting an apartment in most areas. Well, in my, in my neighborhood, you can't rent a house. Right. They don't really have that much in Michigan either. Right. It, it's right. harder. I'm guessing, it, yeah, I don't know if you'd have to do Airbnbs or what. Maybe that's a thing Airbnb can do is, is long-term rentals, right? Where it's it's someone rents their house out for 12 months at a time or something. I don't know. But this is not don't this is not stopping. We're going to get more and more of these emails from people saying, I can't afford a house. Yes. And, and, and one of the reasons why is, I mean, there's a million reasons why, but did, uh, you listened to the Odd Lots episode with Tracy Alloway, Joe Wasenthal, and I forget his name, the, the lumber guy. That was excellent. Talking about lumber prices, what's going on. I think that was my favorite podcast of the year so far. It was because it encapsulated so much to do with the housing market right now, the macro economy. And here's the thing. Not once in that podcast when they're talking about rising demand for housing and rising lumber prices, not once did he say, this is all the Fed's fault. The Fed didn't even come up in that. Nothing from government policy. It was all, he basically said, the reason lumber is at a, such a shortage right now is because things got way too, people went way overboard in 2006 and 7 and 8, and then you had the crash, and then they pulled way back, and now 
they're still so defensive because of that experience and they have the scars from 2008. He's saying these places should, like, new home builders should be building as many homes as they can and buying up land and going crazy and the sawmills should be producing more lumber and they should be expanding and they're all not doing that because they're still so scarred from 2008. Right. Which is such a microcosm of the way so many people's brains got just destroyed from 2008 because they couldn't get out of that bunker mentality. And I was I was surprised to hear him blame title insurance. I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> There's a worker shortage piece in Wall Street Journal about especially fast food places. I go to grab a chicken and egg at Chick-fil-A right by my office. Hold on. Yesterday. Explain. Explain. I have questions. Okay. What's a, what's a chicken and egg? So chip, uh, Chick-fil-A, they have their good chicken, right? So Great it's a, chicken. It's a little breakfast filet with egg and cheese on a bagel. I chicken, egg, and cheese. It's very good. Surprisingly good, yes. I'm a big Chick-fil-A fan. Uh, I go sans bagel, though, because got to keep that dad bought off for the summer. But breakfast is closed yesterday because they don't have enough people to work. Ooh. Now what? I think this is happening this is gonna happen everywhere. A lot of these places, they're gonna have to pay more. These all these places, I think we're gonna like whether we want it or not, fifteen dollar minimum wage is basically coming based on demand. Chipotle said that they're paying thir- that Chipotle's average wage is thirteen dollars and in their quarterly call, if they were to pay fifteen dollars, it would hit their margins by like a hundred or two hundred basis points. So if they were to pass it on to the customer, it would raise prices by what two percent? Yeah, it's, it's nothing. Not a big deal. So what's very good for the the low wage worker is going to have a negligible impact and on honestly, prices. I, I'm fine paying a little higher prices for that stuff for these people who have been on the front lines working and giving us food this whole entire pandemic. Like those people should be making more money. Right. All right, this is a good one. My financial advisor has half of my portfolio in cash bonds and hedge funds that haven't moved in years. Waiting for the dip. I know you two can speak of this. Any thoughts? Go ahead. So I don't want to like speak ill of any other financial advisor. We don't know what the plan is. The But here's a question I would have if you're in this situation. Did you put me in this portfolio understanding my risk profile and time horizon and my needs? Or are you just trying to make me a lot of money in and buy the dip when stocks fall or whatever. Um, because there's a totally different set of circumstances between we put you in this portfolio because it matches your willingness, need, and ability to take risk versus I'm trying to time the market and I was worried that things got too hot, so I put you in hedge funds and cash and bonds and we're going to wait and see what happens. That's totally two totally different ways of managing money. And so that's the question I would ask if my advisor was doing this is, why was I in this portfolio in the first place, and does it suit my needs and goals? Yeah, well said. I'm nothing to add. Um, ben posted a tweet today about purchasing a new car. You're a leaser. You're leasing a new car. I would love to hear your take on purchasing a used car versus a, uh, versus leasing. I'm I'm a lease guy. It's just it's more fun. Uh, yeah, I like, is, I, part of it is more fun. I never thought I'd be a lease guy. Tell me why you lease. Well, because I like getting a, a new car every three years. That's it. That's part I don't, of it. I don't enjoy the process of, of going into the dealership. I spoke about using a car broker last year, but uh, I think that buying a car might be more economical. And actually, we got... Well, buying ins- a more car is more economical if you pay it off and then drive it for a few years afterwards where you don't have a payment. That's where buying a, a new car and holding it forever so it's like years eight through, time. So it's like years 8 through 11 or whatever? Yes, or five through eight. Yeah, okay. so that's where you make up all the money is when you don't have a car payment and you can save. If you want a thorough analysis, Jesse Kramer emailed us a really long and detailed analysis of the true cost of owning a car. It's way higher than I thought. Way, 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 way higher. But owning versus leasing, it's all there, so I, I recommend you, so my, here's, you check here's, that out. Here's my other thing why I lease. So I like, I like the thing about having a new car every once in a while too, but... I have young kids. They destroy our vehicles. Mm, right. I would I would much rather have the dealership take on that destruction than me personally owning it. And you can always buy a car after the lease. I'm sure people would uh, will get in our emails and tell us how we're dumb for doing that. I don't mind it. The, the payment's lower. And here's the thing. I had a lease that was running up in February. So I still have close to a year, 10 months left. And it was called last week and said, hey, your used car lease is worth way more than we thought. We'll give you a new model, and it's the same exact payment. So I get two years of a new model, same payment, done. The downside is you have to move to Idaho to get the car. 